Good morning and thank you for joining the 3IE member webinar, Labor Market Impact Evaluation Lab, Establishing a Policy Research Engagement Between the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the Kingdom of Morocco. So my name is Jennifer Ludwig. I'm a 3IE Senior Program Manager and before we get started, just wanted to provide a quick introduction to our uh, member webinar series. So this is um, a quarterly uh, webinar series for 3IE members, representatives of 3IE member organizations. We have over 50 members that include um, bilateral and multilateral donors, international um, NGOs, and um, government agencies from low and middle income countries. The purpose of the webinar is to explore issues and innovations related to rigorous evidence for development decision making that are um, developed from our members. So they're, they're really member owned projects and, um, and research. Uh, the webinars are presented by member representatives, staff, and, and occasionally by external experts. And um, yeah, the purpose is to really promote what, uh, what our members are doing, um, support the interests that members have um, have shared with us for peer learning and interest in networking, strengthening community of practice, and, and helping really 3IE to engage more with staff from member agencies, especially uh, large member agencies, when often we only kind of meet with the same couple of people over time in person. Uh, so to introduce our speakers, we first have Ryan Moore, who is the director evaluation at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is a U.S. government foreign assistance agency that fights to end global poverty. Ryan currently manages all education sector evaluations, ensuring the technical quality of deliverables, guiding a sectoral learning agenda, and overseeing the contract and budget management of eight monitoring and evaluation staff. On an operational and policy level, Ryan has acted as a key member of MCC's project development reform efforts, Pay for Results Working Group, industry and academia engagement efforts, and other cross-departmental interagency and partnership initiatives. Ryan also leads the design and operations of MCC's first foray into results-based financing in Morocco, including due diligence for a first-of-its-kind government-funded social impact fund and job placement services. In Morocco, Ryan worked with the ministries of finance and labor to analyze existing results-based financing mechanisms in which multi-year budgets are allocated by the Ministry of Finance and conditioned on employment metrics, integrating key analytical findings into a technical improvement plan and project implementation plan. He also co-leads the implementation of an impact evaluation lab in Morocco for the ministry-led policy research on youth employment. Before joining MCC, Ryan worked with TechnoServe in Mexico, supporting their country director in building m and &E frameworks for two agribusiness projects. He graduated from the Harvard Kennedy School with a Master in Public Administration and International Development. Our other speaker today is Mario Picon, who is a Senior Evaluation Specialist from 3IE. Uh, before joining 3IE, Mario worked at the World Bank as a Program Coordinator for Poverty and Social Impact Analysis in South Asia, and he developed the Gender Innovation uh, Lab South Asia, which is a platform for impact evaluation and analytical work in support of World Bank operations. His thematic experience at the bank included microfinance, governance, social accountability, gender-based violence, water and sanitation, transport, energy, and green growth. His previous evaluation experience includes the independent external evaluation of the Food and Agricultural Organization and the former development effectiveness and poverty areas at the Inter-American Development Bank. His evaluation experience also includes consultancy work with international NGOs in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Mario has previously worked at the Central Bank, Ministry of Labor, and think tanks in Peru. He has a PhD in public policy with a specialization in international development from the University of Maryland. He has an MSc in agricultural, environmental, and regional economics and another master's degree in demography from the uh, Penn State University. He holds a uh, Bachelor in Science in Economics from the Pontifica Universidad Catalana of Peru. And at 3IE, he works very closely with uh, members, particularly on member services, and also um, 
other aspects of our impact evaluation programming. So I'm just going to hand this over to Ryan and, and we'll get started. All right, great. Um, let's see if my uh, testing, testing, hoping uh, folks can hear me. Um, complain at us if you can't, uh, since uh, we can't uh, see any of you. Um, uh, they, they say that uh, pictures are, are worth a thousand words, so perhaps uh, for my bio, I, I should have sent over Jen a picture instead of the uh, apparently thousand word bio. I apologize for uh, uh, forcing you all to listen to, uh, to a tome on, on my, uh, my life experiences, uh, etc. But um, anyhow, I'm excited to kick this off. Um, uh, and without saying any more about myself, since uh, Jen gave such a uh, wonderful introduction, um, a little bit about uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. For those who aren't familiar, uh, I would imagine uh, some of you are, but for those who aren't, uh, uh, MCC is a U.S. government foreign assistance agency, and uh, our uh, singular mission is uh, poverty reduction through economic growth. Um, and we were created in, in 2004 um, as a different approach to, to U.S. foreign assistance and uh, these uh, 13 years I think have been a process of growth but a testament to uh, sort of a, you know some of the strengths of, uh, of this particular approach that I'm not going to get into a lot of exactly how MCC works. Uh, feel free to reach out if you'd like sort of more information on, on MCC, our scorecard, there's always a lot of really interesting questions there and, and I'd love to chat later. But one of the things that uh, MCC has been known for over its uh, history, rather short history, is um, pushing the boundaries of rigorous evaluation and always uh, pushing the boundaries on value for money of, you know, U.S. taxpayer money that we are uh, charged with using effectively. and. You know, 2004 when we started was right sort of the early days of uh, using impact evaluation, randomized evaluation in development programs. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of really fascinating opportunities, all sorts of stories to tell there. Um, but uh, as we sort of got to the early, uh, early evaluations, you know, they often take three, four, five years to turn over because these are big, long programs. And so around um, 2011, 2012, we started to get a sort of portfolio of evaluations um, back. And uh, we found that um, results were mixed for a variety of reasons. Some reasons perhaps programmatic, some reasons related to how we do our evaluations. And so some of the things that we learned out of that is that there had been this sort of default separation between our monitoring and evaluation units and our operations units and even more so between our evaluators and our operations in the field um, uh, that wasn't very productive. There was this idea that, you know, we would, we would send these people out sort of like the econometric auditors and they would find out did it work and if it worked then, you know, great. If not, then somebody would have hell to pay. Sort of, I don't know if it was exactly that mentality, but it was certainly a sort of more accountability focused evaluation uh, that, you know, most people who have done uh, this type of evaluation realizes is not super productive. You know, audits have their purposes, but rigorous evaluation, it, generally auditing is, is not, or that sort of heavy handed, is, can, you know, accountability is certainly one of the, the features of impact evaluation, but not uh, uh, an, an only feature. So next, looking um, for, for random assignment opportunities was really what drove a lot of our earlier evaluations, which was, you know, if there's some unit on which we can randomize, then great, this is a great impact evaluation opportunity, let's pursue it, you know, uh, even in a lot of cases where maybe that program wasn't always the feature, the biggest program, or the, you know, the critical uh, theory of change maybe didn't even flow through that particular uh, piece of the program fully and so um, that also sort of was a bit um, a learning that we had to do which was you know maybe we did have some great randomizations but they weren't the most interesting piece of the program and our operations staff would say sure that was like a cutesy little pilot program that you tested and you know it, it's interesting but you didn't get out a lot of the other questions that, that were there to answer. 
And then sort of the black box syndrome that a lot of impact evaluations have been through, I think, in the, in the last 10 years, uh, which is, you know, asking just did it work on some sort of big primordial level, you know, in this case, did household income increase? If it didn't, then we don't care. Uh, again, I don't think anyone at MCC was thinking that way at the, at, at the time, but right, it was, it was, there was a lot of evaluations where we didn't have a clear capture of what was the theory of change that, by which we expected to have results. And so the, we sort of had a light bulb moment in which we, um, we realized that, you know, we had to change a little bit about how we were doing our impact evaluations uh, from uh, sort of what was the goal of using impact evaluations, right? So a, more of a learning focus uh, with specifically focus on learning about uh, how do we improve our investments? How do we do get better value for money? Uh, how do we uh, sort of improve how we're designing and implementing our projects? Um, and then how do we do those impact evaluations, right? These are not simple things. These are often, you know, $50 million infrastructure programs that you've randomized at a village level. These are not sort of cutesy test pilots. These are generally, you know, uh, or at least in a lot of cases, large complex programs that happen over a period of, are implemented over a period of five years. So um, understanding feasibility ex ante was a learning, right? We had a lot of evaluations that sort of either ended up being less rigorous than we expected because of feasibility challenges or uh, perhaps cost a lot more than we expected because of similar challenges. Um, and so th that was critical. Uh, Another couple, I won't spend too much time, but right, timing following the program logic, if you go in and you collect data uh, before you, any reasonable person would have expected change to have uh, occurred, then you know, that's an obvious uh, thing that um, various operational challenges made, you know, uh, were challenging and I think we're, we're focusing a lot more on that question now. Um, and then sort of to wrap up on this sort of some of the learnings out of that first uh, sort of generation and the things that we're still sort of working on, focusing on is making sure that our sector staff, our operations staff really are sort of key stakeholders in this, that they're not just sort of bystanders and say, okay, well, we're going to tell you if you can randomize, you have to randomize and whether you think this is an interesting, relevant evaluation or, if you, you know, whether you think you're, we're measuring the right things or not, we don't care. Obviously, I think, you know, uh, the, the narrative now, right, around making sure they are a key partner. Anyone who's operating this program is a key partner. And sort of uh, what I might call a light bulb, but is still sort of incipient. And what I want to talk about a little bit today is, you know, how do we uh, have more of a country focus? How do we integrate more with the demands of the specific policy challenges, the policy constraints in the countries we're working in, and potentially how do we use evaluation as a tool to better inform change and innovation on policy fronts there. Um, so um, just a real quick, you know, uh, anyone who's worked in Morocco or knows much about Morocco knows that uh, labor market constraints are, are a massive constraint. Uh, things like, you know, more than 40% of urban youth being unemployed, um, you know, uh, among the lowest women's labor force participation in the world, um, and a massive informal economy for, you know, related in some direct or indirect way related to the, the labor market constraints. And so as MCC was beginning to develop what we call a compact, which is a five-year grant with the government of Morocco, we worked with the African Development Bank and uh, our government co uh, economists, counterparts, as well as MCC economists to uh, apply the growth diagnostics methodology, which is focused on diagnosing binding constraints to growth. And out of that, uh, again, perhaps not surprising, two of the key constraints that came up were labor market regulations and the, and the availability of industry-relevant skills. Um, but I think we were left with sort of a, a policy problem. There were some domains on which there were obvious constraints and we developed programming around those constraints in the vocational education space, in the sort of secondary education space, but uh, in the sort of more uh, regulatory uh, policy for, format on employment, uh, there, the evidence was, the evidence is mixed. There's a lot of programs that have been shown by rigorous uh, methods not to work. Um, and 
a lot of the evidence that we do have in this space of employment and labor market policy it generally is in many cases is not extremely feasible given that sort of the political lines in the sand are, are drawn. So sort of as we thought about, okay, you've got, you know, labor markets have sort of three fundamental components, you know, systems which uh, demand skills, uh, you know, uh, systems uh, which produce skills as, and then sort of uh, functions uh, or systems which link the two. And, um, you know, so these are sort of systems of systems. It's a sort of complex beast, but as we developed our programming, we ended up having sort of a few different uh, pieces. We had a land project which focused on some of the constraints on private sector demand, which, um, you know, without access to land that is governed sort of in a, in a productive way, uh, businesses can't grow. Uh, on the supply side, right, our employability projects focus on secondary and vocational, as I mentioned. But then on the labor market efficiency side, we were sort of, this is where that puzzle comes up of what exactly is evidence of what can one do and um, so as we s sort of at some point began exploring um, with our uh, counterparts in the government of Morocco, we sort of looked at uh, through sort of one thing, long story, but ended up diving into sort of policy um, programming. And um, you know, policy programming in, in this sort of with the Ministry of Labor and saw that, you know, evaluation was an interesting uh, piece where there was growth but still some major constraints. So without going into too much detail on this slide, right, there's been progress from, you know, even as few as, you know, 10, uh, 10 12 years ago having simply not a terribly structured framework on how, um, how the these types of programs were evaluated or thought of in terms of sort of rigorous uh, evaluation and monitoring and development over time. I, I won't go into it too much, but to the point where we now have, you know, I think a place, we're, we're at a good place in which the Ministry of Labor is thinking about, okay, how do we evaluate our programs? How do we make sure that we're feeding uh, evidence back into how we make policy? Um, and some of the challenges that, that in fact, our, our government counterparts have identified um, are, you know, um, right, that there's not a lot of emphasis on, on the questions of impact evaluation or sort of causal attribution. What did this policy do? Not just sort of what changed in the environment over time. Um, uh, not a lot of culture of thinking about these questions uh, of, of, of causal attribution. Um, gaps in, in data systems regarding employment um, issues, employment policy, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we've got and some, com some capacity constraints as well in terms of how does one try to improve these policies through evidence. Um, and so, you know, the, the top line that we started thinking, right, is that there, there's progress being made, but at the same time, um, there are still major, major gaps that the, you know, labor market policy and programs are, are still a sort of structural constraint to growth in Morocco. And so there's need to sort of think outside the box while the programs that exist, some of them are innovative, some of them are interesting. You know, uh, there's sort of an affluence of lots of different mechanisms and, and there's, there's uh, room to one still continue to test new solutions and I think um, our, our colleagues uh, and our champions have been committed to this idea of that there are new things out there that can be tested that haven't uh, been tested and then right there's often this also this question of uh, sort of the political economy of evidence which is uh, lending credibility to promising uh, solutions or I put an asterisk there and you know in some cases one of the best things that evidence can do is point to programs that may not be as effective as, as we would hope. Right, and impact evaluations, this question of looking at uh, what does a, what would have happened without a program and what actually happened when we implemented a program, that question of impact evaluation can uh, help us answer a number of critical questions that could feed back into how policy is made. And so, 
uh, in the process of developing what uh, the, the whole uh, compact, the agreement with the Moroccan government is a $450 million agreement um, over between years of 2017 and 2022 will be implemented. Um, we agreed to include an initiative to try and push the boundaries and sort of strengthen the capacity within uh, the Ministry of Labor um, uh, and other pertinent entities um, around employment policy impact evaluation. And so sort of the first step we realized is, you know, if you want to bring credible evaluation, you need credible evaluators and you need the right skill sets. So I think we, from the beginning, knew bringing in a research partner that could bring that sort of rigor and credibility uh, to, to this initiative would sort of separate it as not a sort of pure, pure political move or some form of, you know, giving answers to, you know, uh, giving answers to policymakers of what they actually wanted to hear in the first place, but actually bringing some sort of uh, academic and research credibility. Um, and then the, the idea of jointly defined research agenda being important, that this is not a, we certainly don't uh, look for a purely academic endeavor which answers purely theoretical questions which are fascinating to uh, uh, researchers on the boundaries of what evidence exists but, you know, sort of rooted in the local realities and challenges. Uh, uh, so jointly defining that research agenda, we think can uh, empower that uh, sort of balance between the power of sort of local policy, uh, but also the, the rigor of, of international research. Right? And that, then that we would actually, in addition, not just sort of building capacities or changing policies or whatnot, but actually, that we would actually learn, hope that we can, we hope that we can learn by doing in the sense that actually bring together new research projects, whether they be let's get the data together to do rigorous evaluation of policies that exist, or let's test out new things uh, that we think might uh, have positive impacts and rigorously test those. So I'm getting close to 20 minutes in, I think, uh, but I'm, I think I'm doing okay. Um, so, um, what we're sort of roughly calling the labor market impact evaluation initiative, uh, we've been tossing around the term impact, uh, the labor market impact evaluation lab, but uh, uh, the, the title at this point uh, doesn't matter as much except for the, the fact that, you know, uh, we um, are planning to finance up to, to $5 million uh, through this initiative. Um, to do rigorous impact evaluations and to, to be clear in this space of labor market policies and programs, you know, there are so many complexities that often RCTs are not sort of the only and the critical uh, path uh, research method. So uh, while impact evaluations we are obviously uh, sort of the, uh, a priority and something that we think uh, can lend that extra credibility uh, is not our only uh, tool. Um, and then sort of broadly bringing together the, the policymakers and the researchers uh, to actually bring together interesting studies that do answer locally uh, sourced questions um, and, uh, you know, that, and we think that there may be some sort of capacity building as well, right, of critical elements within uh, policymaking bodies or even research institutions in Morocco that already have sort of that uh, role, uh, figuring out how do we strengthen their sort of ability to generate evidence, policymakers' ability to uh, either commission or or use evidence sort of appropriately. These are also, you know, potentially uh, paths that we could pursue. Um, we did a, some, a sort of deep dive on uh, what what exists out there, right? I, I, I think, you know, People are recognizing that this is a space that matters, that, you know, moving beyond just pure theory-driven uh, evaluations or sort of uh, pure, um, pure sort of academic uh, evaluation is important. Many people have recognized this, uh, but it's still a fairly new space in the sense that there, there, there are not uh, a huge affluence of people out there doing that. Uh, but we, we dug in and sort of looked at uh, some of the interesting actors that are really uh, trying to, to push new ground on, on this space. And 
I won't go into details uh, afterwards. I think we can potentially send the, the slides that I have an annex detailing out some of the, the features of these different uh, initiatives. But, you know, they range uh, across the gamut of, of approach. But the, 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 there are a lot of, there are these institutions and others, uh, apologies if there are uh, others that are out there that I, I didn't list, um, but that, that are really trying to sort of uh, push the frontier in terms of, you know, linking policymakers to um, uh, credible, credible research. Um, so moving on, um, you know, this idea we, I talked about of co sort of uh, jointly defined research agenda, as well as a, a term that we've used, uh, which is related but not the same, of co-production of actually having, you know, lo local actors having a stake in the, the generation of evidence so that you build up sort of uh, the local capacity on the generation side as well. Um, these were some policies that uh, um, our... Uh, you know, Moroccan colleagues who will, will give some uh, from MCA Morocco will give us some some insight later. Uh, but some of the policy domains that there's really there are open evaluation questions or open things that could uh, benefit from so, uh, rigorous evaluation. Um, I, I won't go into these. Suffice it to say that you know labor markets are complex. The policies and programs that try and solve this constraint are are many, um, and this plethora of, of sort of tools and policy programs, uh, you know, there's endless opportunity to for improvement, certainly, and so, uh, you know, I think the, the, the most sort of interesting thing is that as we sort of looked at that, we found that, um, you know, some of, uh, some of uh, J-PAL did a youth initiative systematic review looking at some of these questions of youth employment uh, among other things, and 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 in their systematic review, pulled together what are uh, what are some of the open questions, and so they they pulled together these questions. Uh, this, uh, these are just a smattering of some of the questions they pulled together, but you know they align really well with a lot of the mechanisms and tools and challenges that that already exist in Morocco. And so uh, my sort of second to last slide here is just sort of a reflection, if you will. Um, the, on, you know, uh, there's always a lot of interest. I think there's a lot of people excited about trying to bridge this gap. And, and people ask, you know, the first question, no, how did you find the right champions? Um, you know, uh, thankfully we have a couple of them on, on the line that may uh, give some comments later. Uh, but I, I don't have a scientific uh, answer to that question of how did we sort of find the people within the government that really cared about this and wanted to push the envelope on uh, evaluation, but uh, suffice it to say that, you know, having conversations with finding the people who are motivated, have sort of uh, a vision and, and adapting our vision uh, to, to that vision it was really critical in, in sort of hearing um, what is it, what are the problems that, that they perceive and that they've seen in their work in the government and how can we sort of uh, be a sort of a force uh, for change and, and make an investment uh, that could potentially have some some good impacts. Um, and then sort of asking the right questions of sort of having these conversations in the first place. I think donors have the, the sort of challenge of donors and multilaterals, uh, lenders, etc. all sort of have this challenge of we need to get to a program. What's the program? What's, what's, the, what's the project? How's it going to get done? We need to get it done quick. You know, and, and in MCC we have a five-year clock that doesn't change, right? We don't have extensions that five-year clock expires in our programs. You know, MCC money has to be anything that's unspent returns back to the U.S. Treasury. And so uh, that uh, also means that, you know, we're really focused on how do we get this thing done. But I think having these questions at the outset of what's the this really the, the policy challenge and how uh, how do these tools potentially play into that is something that, that I think we've done uh, here. And, uh, you know, last patience, this, you know, I, I think a dose, I always have a real dose of humility here, one that we have not started this yet in the sense, in the real formal true sense, this is a real thing, but it's not sort of fully kicked off, right, that this has taken years, right, the incubation of this idea, earliest conversations were now, you know, about three years ago. Um, 
Uh, and it's been now, you know, two years since we agreed with the Moroccan government, yes, this is something we want to pursue as part of this uh, five-year compact. Um, right, and next year we hope to actually really uh, start our engines, get things rolling. So, you know, patience, recognizing that sort of, uh, what's the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, trying to little by little get this thing rolling and, and excited about it. Um, and I already mentioned a little bit, pursue areas where interests align until something clicks. I think, you know, we had different iterations of this idea, different uh, sort of uh, places we explored, what the constraints were, and this seemed like a place that really fit everyone's, you know, fit the evidence as well as fit uh, the different sort of interests. And my last slide, um, you know, just a sense for those who are interested, uh, you know, we are about to kick off a process later this year into next, early next year perhaps, of recruiting a research partner, someone, you know, an, an, an entity who can uh, bring this sort of research credibility and rigor to this initiative, uh, partnering with the government of Morocco. Um, and that process will be sort of uh, doing, uh, we hope to do a sort of two-phase process by which uh, MCA will request qualifications of those uh, of interested entities and have a short list to to be able to uh, connect uh, with MCA Morocco and interested uh, uh, policy makers in Morocco um, and then actually get this thing started uh, early next year into the beginning of next year with diagnostics and eventually you know specific uh, research projects so um, with that I will uh, wrap up uh, my portion and hand it back to Jen Sure. Thanks, Ryan. So we had we'd planned for one of uh, Ryan's colleagues from Morocco to, to provide a few brief remarks, and, and unfortunately he was able uh, unable to join. So we're going to just go right into Mario's comments. Um, before he starts, I wanted to mention just two things to people. One is um, just to note that we will be sending uh, a PDF of the PowerPoints today um, to people who, who joined in. Um, and additionally, um, an appendix that, that Ryan provided with, with more um, information on, on some of the examples of, of um, other initiatives that he mentioned. Um, the other thing is um, in, we will have time for a brief uh, Q&A session. And I would just encourage people to either you can type questions. Um, there's a, there should be a section on your screen that just has questions on it, you can type them in there. You can also um, send comments or questions through the chat section. Hello there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Ryan, for joining us today um, in this webinar, uh, part of the members member webinar sem uh, series of 3IE. Um, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> I'm just going to provide a few remarks uh, around the presentation that Ryan just did. Um, we at 3IE are very happy to, uh, to have been involved uh, at the, in the conversation around this research initiative in Morocco. Um, <clears throat> Ryan and I precisely met discussing this some time ago um, in, for example, how 3IE approaches the whole discussion about working with a particular country through country policy windows, uh, which is one of our facilities. Um, so just uh, let me just give you a few remarks around uh, what Ryan has shared with everybody um, from a different point of view, maybe from the from the particular uh, challenge and advantages of thinking of an, an initiative like this, not only as a research facility with five million dollars for research, but as an opportunity for institutionalizing evidence in Morocco. Um, uh, just, I just have three basic slides here. Um, I, always, I always say that uh, an initiative like this is one of those opportunities in which you can really give evidence a chance. Um, and, <clears throat> and here's the thing, um, many, many of you even, uh, and, and many people out there know 3IE for the work that we do through our grant windows funding impact evaluations, but there's a lot of, of other things that go behind, right? Um, it, it's not only about funding the research itself, but it's also about creating that local capacity to be able to, um, or support that local capacity to be able to use that evidence and translate it into policy. Um, so though that, that additional element that I'm gonna be talking about, this uh, 
uh, helping build an ecosystem is key, especially when you think in, uh, in terms of sustainability. So um, the way I see this is, 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 is one piece or one way to translate, to reflect what are those alternative models uh, generating alternative incentives um, for rigorous, uh, rigorous research to be done at a country level um, with support of external partners, of course, but also creating certain capacity um, and the conditions for that uh, research to be useful for policy and applicable to policy, right? Um, and I see all those different elements in what Ryan has shared here today. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, typically, when we think about a, a creating or generating or building an institutional uh, setting in a given country um, for rigorous research to be produced and used, we think in terms of either accountability of the funds use, right? That's very, very common, of course. Um, but more and more, it's like there's, it's, there's this discussion about how do you really improve policy? Um, because as Ryan said, it's like it could be that your impact evaluation provides um, no effects, right? It, it, it ends up concluding that there were no effects or that uh, maybe the effects were even negative. Um, the key thing is that the impact evaluation should aim at providing additional information that can tell you why or how is it that this worked out. Because what you want is elements for correction too. Um, there are certain policies that you can immediately phase out because it's pretty obvious that they are not working, right? And what this rigorous evidence is going to give you is like a strong reason to just cut it down, phase it out, etc. But at the same time, there are other programs that on a very core, uh, in the very core form, they have a theory of change that makes sense, right? It makes sense that we should be doing this. Why is it not working? And the key question is like, how can we do it better? This also makes and changes the dynamic of how rigorous evidence is produced and how it is used. And this is how it should be, really. Um, the accountability reason is still important and will be there and will be very important for what, uh, what is being done with public uh, funds, uh, being the government of Morocco and their own funds, or being MCC as a donor, right, and accounting for the use of those resources to the American people. So, um, uh, so it's like what I see here is like there's this opportunity precisely to shift a little bit the discussion internally at the country level um, on how do we improve policy so it is more effective too um, as, a, as, a, as a core objective that can live at the same time uh, with the accountability reason. Um, now, we have seen different models of how to stimulate the demand side of evidence out there. Um, sometimes uh, we can be talking or, or, or see uh, entire government level institutions, right? Um, like in the case of Latin America, you have Synergia, you have Coneval, um, that, uh, that are able actually to, uh, to stimulate doing evaluation of government programs um, and they actually share indicators and results through of them and they are able to monitor what is the progress of certain indicators like in the case of Coneval and poverty, food security, etc. In other cases, other ways to institutionalize um, a, 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 the, the, the use of rigorous evidence and the generation of rigorous evidence in a, in a country have to do with these councils of researchers and policy makers, right? And engaging that local pool of, of, of researchers that know, um, uh, know the particular situation in context of the country. <clears throat> there are other institutional solutions that are more like internal facilities. Within a particular government agency, you stimulate the discussion about what are the problems that we are facing, right, <clears throat> in this particular sector, um, and how are we going to be able to pilot or um, scale up, depending on what stage you are at, um, particular policy solutions and how are we going to evaluate them um, along the way. For example, in Peru, the, the Minedu Lab, for example, for, for education. And that is actually where I'm starting to put, at this point, the Morocco Initiative, even though um, it also has those elements of generating councils or engaging local researchers uh, as, um, as uh, engaging the research community with the policy community, um, as Ryan was saying. Um, so, 
so uh, building these internal research facilities, and I'm just uh, I'm just uh, speaking in a very generic sense, has several advantages. First is the focus, right, in a particular topic, in the problems that uh, the sector is facing, etc. But also there's this soft side that many times is not sufficiently highlighted of how are you able to build internal coalitions, right? Uh, Ryan was talking about champions, but the champions are actually not easy to identify sometimes. And sometimes maybe more uh, in the introvert side, right? Um, within a particular government agency. You, of course, identify the big minister that is interested or the vice minister that is interested in, in promoting um, a, a, a evidence-informed policy, but uh, but it's like there may be other people in the different units of a given ministry that are interested also in doing this, but don't necessarily ha have a way to do it. So what you offer here is a space in which there may be an internal conversation, right, about the challenges that we face, and that way that support for the rigorous evidence that is going to allow me to improve my program or my project or my particular policy solution, right, generates more interest and more buy-in from the beginning because that research is going to be answering the key questions that those particular actors within the government agency and the people around them are interested in. And the research is not being aimed uh, at, at that at a very uh, strong academic research, which is good, it's important, right? But it's like, we want to be sure that the questions that are being answered um, are actually useful uh, in terms of policy. So let me go with the last slide there, um, just to wrap up here. Um, uh, like what, what, what we, have, uh, we have learned over the years in 3IE, I guess, and we're still building this particular uh, vision of how do we do a country focus um, work that responds to, the, to those local needs is precisely that it takes the village. It's about building ecosystems in the end. Um, and and we, we are actually attempting to do a little bit of more uh, trying, to, trying to help complement these efforts at the local level through, for example, the services that we provide to our members. Um, and what we have learned, for example, that many times it's not only the demand side of the government agency for rigorous evidence, what is important, but it's also is finding ways to strengthen the supply side, um, understanding what are the needs of that particular context. Um, and then nurturing that community with information, with networks, with evidence, um, and the discussion of how that evidence can be applied um, to the particular challenges that, that they face. So I do see that this is a great opportunity to nurture, to experience, to make like help grow this particular community, this discussion about the use of rigorous evidence and um, for, for solving, for, for tackling many of the challenges uh, in the labor markets in, uh, in Morocco. Uh, I guess it's a wonderful experience. Um, I, that I feel very, very encouraging to see how, how Ryan and his team has been able to develop. And again, an opportunity um, to, to build this, uh, this community in Morocco, internal to the Ministry of Labor, but also um, at the level of, for example, local research, right, um, that is able to help and contribute to the sustainability of whatever, uh, whichever outcomes they are able to, uh, to generate in terms of um, a, a research and the use of that, uh, that evidence in, in policy. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Jen? Okay. You can just, um, just to share one more slide with you, uh, we have some sites and also contact details. If you have questions um, following the webinar today, you can go ahead to send. And again, we'll be circulating this later. Uh, we do have a few minutes for Q&A, and we had one question uh, that came in from Anastasia De Santos. And um, please, if other people have questions, go ahead and, and put those into the, the question box. So the question from Anastasia is for Ryan, and her question is, are your plan impact evaluations going to be able to look at displacement effects in local labor markets? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, so as you may have guessed, based on the, the sort of structure and design of this initiative, right, we, we will 
we, once we have our research partner on board, do the call for um, call for uh, sort of specific research projects and 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 bring that process together. So I, I can't say, but what I can say is that this is something I'm I'm working on a similar uh, another project that was mentioned in my bio around results based financing for job placement services. Uh, where one pays for uh, job placement and retention results. Um, and I will say that this question has made my knees tremble uh, for a very long time. Uh, but I, I think that there, one, there are two things. There are ways uh, around it. Uh, but I, in my own research, have found a grand total in the universe of evaluations, one evaluation uh, that is a, a rigorous randomized evaluation that deals with this question. And interestingly, it found that a project that without uh, displacement effects would have looked really effective. But once taken into account, uh, job losses among non-participants uh, via sort of a second uh, randomized uh, control group, they, they found that the program effectively didn't have a positive effect. Um, so, uh, anyways, that but again, that's one, and that was Esther Duplo, and it was a randomization of randomizations, and no one ever will be able to replicate that evaluation. Uh, but uh, I do think that the, the, it's an important question, right? To make, it, and that's actually one of the big sort of uh, attribution problems in any employment results, right? Is it's possible that you measure employment results among? Ryan, can you clarify if you're type the World Bank Jordan voucher program? Is that no idea. It's like a follow-up question. Okay, so, I, so I, I don't know anything about it. Um, I would ha be happy to okay. talk to the people who who work on that. Um, uh, but I, I don't I don't think that it's it's a if I know which one that is, I don't think that that's a, an employment one. But it may be. Uh, okay. In any case, I really can't answer much. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think that's an important, interesting question on the like technical domain. Uh, other questions, and I mean, people I imagine can feel free to unmute and sort of you don't have to write your questions into the question box. And then I think uh, Mario also has a couple uh, questions lined up uh, if we if we uh, have time for it. Sure. And yeah, unfortunately, the um, I don't know that people can unmute themselves, oh. <laughs> but wow. um, but I am monitoring the the question box um, right now. I think people are are uh, pretty quiet, but I, I do know Mario had some, some questions. Cool. Actually, we can unmute people, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway, if anyone has a question, uh, maybe uh, shoot a line in the, um, in the question box, and it looks like we can unmute you uh, here. Um, I guess I can just ask the question. They will, they will hear me um, right now. Um, uh, yeah, Ryan, actually, uh, my question was more on the side of the details, uh, right, of the processes and all. Uh, and I understand, I mean, that maybe uh, this is still not figured it out, or maybe you have like a couple of ideas of how this is going to work in practice, right? Um, how is the engagement with within the, the um, the Minister of Labor is uh, is is it like a, a particular office that is going to be uh, uh, built? Sorry. Um, oh, we have we have somebody. Yeah, we'll you, have. But you're good now. I guess somebody is is. Oh, uh, maybe I don't know. Is there anyone asking a question? No. Anyway, um, sorry. Continue. I. Yes, I, I heard uh, somebody's voice. So, so sorry about that. So I was wondering about the how it how is going to work in practice in terms of what is the setting at the Minister of Labor? Um, an office is that office going to communicate yeah. only with the research partner? Is it going to be like a discussion within the ministry uh, in that sense? Um, and in terms of um, the five million dollars, right? For example, for the fund, uh, is there an idea of like how much of that is? Uh, be going to be dedicated to, let's say, pure research versus like this building, this partnership that you were talking about, um, or for example, other uh, other, ex other expenses in country that are related, um, and what kind of topics are going to be included there. That's it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think um, there's some exciting. Uh, Opportunities on that front. I, 
you know, and that's some of the stuff we've been working on over the last uh, year is is exactly that. But I I must say, uh, so one sort of key partner that we expect to drive this is the the National Labor Market Observatory, which is an entity which sits within the Ministry of Labor, and uh, you know drives one of their mandates is. Um, uh, labor market uh, data and information systems on some fronts, but also evaluation of, of uh, uh, employment and labor market policies. So uh, we certainly think that they uh, would be an interesting. Uh, there, there's actually sorry, I step back. They definitely are sort of a key party to this. But we also think that in Morocco, and I think this is the case in many countries. Uh, these policies are uh, interministerial, interagency, if you will, uh, right? And so you can't sort of solve any policy problem, uh, or in many cases, you know, the coordination challenges of data systems is one of the things that prevents really good evaluation. And so uh, we certainly don't plan to have. Okay, we're only going to work uh, within the mandate of this one particular agency or ministry uh, uh, but but yeah we're, we've got some stuff that I would uh, hope to be able to share a little bit more about uh, later on down the road of exactly how that might work out but we certainly plan to bring in uh, policy makers and have projects that sort of either span different entities or are sort of housed at or or, or focused on different these different entities because it's really it's a complex environment in which there are a lot of different actors trying to sort of, uh, you know, improve the labor market. Um, and then I think your your second question, if I uh, understood it, was actually remind me just to make sure I'm. I feel like you had sort of a second piece of your question that I. I'm not sure if I answered. No, I mean I guess that you you get to it. Um, I was more thinking on that precisely on how, how that. Um, how that setup was going to be, and actually, I was very interested in seeing if there was going to be some sort of coordination and discussion with yeah. other ministries because the topic, in the end, um, is a is a is a very important con uh, 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 country countrywide. And I was I was speaking before about the importance of the coordination within the agency, right? But as important as that is also to involve others that we may be working in other government agencies in the country um, towards the same objectives, the same yeah. goals. Yeah, no, I, I think one of the we we without going too uh, deep down this path, I think one of the approaches uh, is having one of the approaches that we've seen in other initiatives uh, that we we may very likely end up modeling, but it hasn't been sort of written into stone yet. Is the idea of having a sort of a technical. Um, Sort of academic or sci probably uh, scientific committee, you might call it, that looks at actual research projects and, and evaluates. Okay, are these credible research designs? Are these credible evaluations that we expect to to lead to, uh, you know, policy re relevant evidence? Uh, and then a secondary committee, which is sort of the one who sets the agenda of these are the things that we think are important, and this is how we hope to get to. Uh, Policy relevant uh, questions are, uh, that are being asked, and hopefully, you know, answers that will be actionable. So uh, that model I've seen uh, elsewhere, uh, but but that's not yet necessarily sort of structurally what we're planning. But it's you know one option. Um, so, no, great, right? Uh, Jen, do we have other questions right now or not yet? Um, no, we we don't have other questions. We we have a couple of minutes left. If if anyone wants to send a brief question, if not, I think um, just if if Ryan or Mario, one of you has any, you know, last thoughts, then then we can close out. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll close. Um, you know, I think on this. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, I. I a couple things that I should say. One, uh, it's unfortunate we had some um, technical difficulties getting uh, Mr. Uh, Morad Bentahar and Mr. Saeed Azuzi uh, to join us, who are two uh, critical champions of this from uh, MCA Morocco, which is a 
Moroccan government entity that was set up to implement this five-year compact. Um, so uh, my apologies to them, but my th many thanks as they are two uh, really critical elements in this in the sort of vision that we have. Um, also, I, I should mention a uh, shout out to uh, Caroline Smith who uh, uh, did a, a rotation at MCC last year and uh, was also instrumental in sort of uh, uh, the early phases of this. So, um, and, and thanks to 3IE for inviting me. I appreciate uh, you guys uh, putting this, this together and, and I hope this has been uh, interesting for members. Shoot me emails with questions, but certainly any sort of official uh, inquiries, uh, direct them to uh, Mr. Morad Ben Tahar in, in Morocco. Sure. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Ryan, and, and thanks, Mario, again. Um, and thanks to everyone who, who joined us today. We hope to see you at, at future 3IE events and webinars, and uh, we'll be in touch soon with um, the, the slides from the webinar today.